Hey, it's Jim, and this is level one of the CFA program, the topic on financial statement analysis and the learning module on financial analysis techniques. Let me quickly remind you that we've been through learning modules on the balance sheet and the income statement and the statement of cash flows. And inside each of those readings, we examined financial ratios. And so we could pretty much call this learning module financial ratio analysis, but it's much more than that. What we're going to do over this next 40 slides or so is extract our financial ratios from those previous learning modules, and then we're going to layer them with some important concepts like interpret those ratios, use those ratios to forecast, and maybe use some other techniques like maybe a regression analysis or a CV analysis to add to our understanding of financial analysis. You know, the very first sentences here in this learning module kind of remind us of why we're going through the CFA program. What we're doing here is we're trying to figure out whether or not a particular financial asset or security is fairly valued or undervalued or overvalued. And one of the great ways that we can do this is through uh, financial analysis. So a bunch of LOS is here. Um, go ahead and look at that second one. I'm going to go ahead and go out on a limb and say that's probably the most important one. We'll take a look at these four different categories of ratios. We'll have to calculate them, and that should be pretty easy. But then the important thing is we're going to have to interpret them. So here's an important concept here. Whenever you are asked on the exam to consider a particular ratio, make sure you can calculate it. Make sure you can compare it against the peer firms, and then make sure you can perform some kind of a trend analysis. And then the other important one, skip down to near the bottom, there's this DuPont analysis that was developed, oh, 50 years ago or so by the DuPont Corporation. So it was named, uh, it was named after this analysis. And what it does is it breaks down one of those profitability ratios that we'll talk about into its either three or five components. And if you look at the 15 or 17 or so problems at the end of this learning module, you'll see that most of them come from those two LOSs. All right, let's take a look at this first one here. What is financial analysis all about? What does that tell us here? Selecting, evaluate, interpreting. You know, we do all that kind of stuff from the very beginning of the CFA program all the way to the end of level three. But the focus here is, of course, on financial data. And then, you know, the large body, the large sample of financial data comes from uh, a firm's financial reports balance sheet, income statement, statement of changes in cash flow. We're going to do this by evaluating equity, right? We want to take a look at what's going on on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And then on the other hand, maybe we're a financial institution and we want to lend money to a particular business. And so we have to do a credit analysis. So what that means is that we need to look at the ratios. We're going to use common size. We're going to take a look at some graphs. We're going to use regression analysis. And by the way, there are... Uh, there are only two paragraphs about regression analysis inside of this learning module. So those of you who paid attention to stuff that I've said before might remember that I had multiple econometrics PhD level classes. And so I love regression analysis. So I was disappointed when I saw only two paragraphs. Uh, you're, you're probably not, but I'll, I'll make a comment about, uh, about those two paragraphs when, uh, when we get to that slide towards the end of the slide deck. All right, so what is financial analysis composed of? So think about those three blocks that we have down at the bottom. Economic data. So this is everything that we talked about in our macroeconomic learning module, things like inflation, things like GDP, things like exchange rates. Then we take market data, all the stuff that we can get from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange in that relates to maybe equity analysis, maybe credit analysis as well. And then we take a look at all of the financial statements, which include uh, financial disclosures and reading the Wall Street Journal and all sorts of other fun stuff. So what we do is we take all of this, we lump it into one big old pool, and then we try to figure out what's relevant, what's more important, and what, what's critical. Remember, I've said this to you guys regularly that the Institute is very interested in 
providing us with the educational opportunity to become scientists, right? So we need to do a lot of calculation and computation. There's a science to this, but there's also an element of artistry to it. And that's pretty much what we're saying here. You can take the hard numbers and you can use regression analysis or CV analysis, but sooner or later, you're gonna to have to uh, exercise judgment. And that's an important concept. Now, what, is, uh, what does a financial ratio mean? It, well, it's a, uh, it's a ratio. When do we learn ratios? Kindergarten. That means you have something in the numerator and something in the denominator. So, of course, it's going to tell us the relationship between two variables. And those two variables can come from primarily the balance sheet and the income statement, but you can also go to the cash flow statement to kind of... Uh, uh, look at it at, at more of a layered level of what goes on in the balance sheet and, and the income statement. So I would know these four groups of ratios. In fact, uh, one or two of the questions at the end of the learning module are super simple. They'll say something like, uh, which of the following is an asset investment ratio? And of course, activity ratio is the, is the correct answer on that one. Um, I always tell my students to think of activity ratios in, in the following way. You know, in my, in my corporate finance class, I, we, we do almost always capital budgeting in there. So we're computing net present value uh, almost every day in class uh, for one project or another. And so I tell the students, I'm saying, look, when you're computing these activity ratios, what you're essentially doing is evaluating the executive leadership team, the executive leadership team's effectiveness in finding positive net present value projects. You know, it's one thing to say, oh, uh, this particular uh, product line is gonna have a positive net present value, but it's another thing to do the research and make certain that that thing turns out to have a positive NPV after two or five or 10 years. So remember, effectiveness of uh, investing in positive net present value projects. Then we need to worry about long-term and short-term debt. So that's the two in the middle. Liquidity ratios, they tell us about the firm's ability to satisfy its short-term obligations. The solvency ratio, sometimes they're called uh, debt ratios or leverage ratios. That's the ability of the firm to satisfy its long-term obligations. So think about solvency and liquidity. One of the commonalities is that they're contracts, right? Uh, uh, and accounts payable, uh, wages payable, that's a contract. And then when you issue a bond or take out a bank loan, that's a contract. So remember the difference between short term and long term. And then profitability ratios over there, um, I could make the argument that these are by far the most important ratios that are out there, but they're by far the most important ratios because their numerators and denominators are pretty much a summation of all of the other stuff that goes on on the balance sheet and the income statement. And so what do I say to you guys regularly? What's the goal of the business? Of course, maximize shareholder wealth. What does that mean? Well, the practicality means, well, we'll find product lines in which we can make something for pennies and sell it for dollars. And those profitability ratios are going to tell us uh, about uh, that particular type of a ratio. All right, why do we use these things? Insight, that makes perfect sense. Understand changes. And remember, the, the Institute is very big on the dynamics of not only the economy, but the dynamics inside of a firm. And so you, uh, one of the great advantages of using financial ratios is that you can compute. Here, let me go back here. You know, imagine a column of five or six activity, solvency, liquidity, and profitability ratios in an, ex in an Excel spreadsheet. And imagine that you can see those, each of those over a five-year time period. And so what do you, can you see? You can tell what's going on in the firm. You can say something like, oh, wait a minute, three years ago, we invested in this positive net present value project, and here are the results. So, you know, let me go back here. Maybe the activity ratios were not very good five years ago and four years ago, but all of a sudden we hit this positive NPV project, the activity ratios improve, solvency, liquidity, profitability, all these improve. So you can tell, you can tell over time, this is called trend analysis, understanding the dynamic changes. And of course, I said this earlier that you are going to compute the ratios for the firm uh, under investigation over time, right? Trend analysis, but then we're going to compare them to uh, all the other firms out there the, uh, and against which we compete. Insight into the economic relationship. So let me go back here real quickly. And so you take a look at the ability of a firm to pay its short-term debt. Well, that probably has some kind of a relationship 
uh, to the firm in its ability to pay its long-term debt. So what we can do is we can see relationships between and among all of the financial statements. And ultimately, ultimately, this is what I was saying earlier, they help us estimate earnings in the future and uh, free cash flow in the future. And then assessing a company's financial flexibility. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, what don't we like about these things? What, what are limitations? Well, when you go back here to this, uh, to this third one, peer comparison, well, let's suppose we take two companies like Walmart and Target and we want to compare those. Well, maybe Walmart uses uh, some of the year's digits depreciation and Target uses some other kind of depreciation. So you take a look at these ratios that depend on the depreciation method and you're not comparing apples uh, to apples. So you need to make certain that you kind of reach into both financial statements, Walmart and Target, and extract the stuff, the accounts that are not identically or at least similarly calculated, and then you make some adjustments and then you throw them back in and recalculate the ratios. Uh, there we go. Judgment must be used. Didn't I just say that word uh, a couple of minutes ago? So that's important. In fact, we should have bolded that in uh, in purple or red or something. That's uh, super important. Remember, judgment is part of the artistry skill set that the Institute wants us to uh, wants us to develop. Yeah, assessing the, assessing the consistency of financial ratio analysis. That makes perfect sense. Now, a couple of ways to do this is we can take a look at a common size uh, financial statement. Here's an example of one. Here's Prudential World Assets. And so notice down at the bottom, we're doing this over a, what is that, a six-year window. And so instead of reporting total assets in a dollar amount, we just say something like, oh, total assets, that's going to be 100%. And then we'll go and compute the ratio of cash to total assets, inventory, and so on and so on. So note that down across the bottom, each of those sums to 100. Now, what kind of a quick conclusion can you make about Prudential's uh, uh, balance sheet from this common size. Well, if you look at it, you can say from, you know, over that six year period, nothing has changed. This firm has done absolutely nothing different, at least on, at least on its balance sheet. So we can do this, we can do this horizontally and we can do this vertically. So let me show you uh, two more examples here. So here's the, the second uh, vertical common size analysis. And so you can just go down, there we go. And then below it, you can do graph. And so uh, somewhere in the learning module, there is a handful of graphs and notice how beautiful these are here in, in the colors. Now, when I look at this, I can see the purple going across and I can see the green going across. Those of you who suffer from ocular migraines like I do, you, you'll be pleased to know that those things are not flashing at you, so uh, be careful. Uh, but nevertheless, when you can see the purple going from here to here to here to here, but these things here are pretty constant. So there we go, vertical size analysis. What is the advantage of this? Well, it allows us to view what's happening to each of these asset accounts over time. You know, look at the uh, net plant and equipment. 50%, 50, 51, 51, 52, and 52. Uh, so what does that tell us? You know, incremental investments in uh, property, plant, and equipment, net of accumulated depreciation. So vertical, of course, that's up and down. And then the next one, of course, is going to be horizontal. That's uh, that's across. What you do is you start with uh, the, the base year, call that 100%. And then you just convert those subsequent years into uh, percentages. I mean, I guess if they all grow, like in this case, they all grow. So those percentages will be higher. But if they fall, then those percentages will be less than 100%. The reason that I like this horizontal common size analysis in particular is because you can take a look at the first base year, 100, and then go all the way out to cash. What is that? 105.1. So over that six-year window, cash increased by 5.1%. Net plant and equipment increased by 121%. So you can see the growth rate in each one of these accounts. So that's probably a really good exam question. This one tells you explicitly about the growth in each one of these accounts. Yeah, I think I mentioned uh, these uh, as I went through that. What are we doing here? Yeah, provide insight. Well, that's that's been in several slides already. 
identify ways in which the company finances itself. That makes sense. Peer comparisons. Uh, what don't we like about it? Yeah, counting standards down at the bottom. That makes perfect sense. Remember, we have all those U.S. standards and we have the international standards, not to mention the different types of uh, rules and regulations with inside of uh, those governing bodies and allow us to use different kinds of uh, financial models and accounting models to come up with inventory valuation, depreciation expense, and revenue recognition, all that good kind of stuff. Um, but also, we can uh, be super concerned about different currencies and that, uh, that common size balance sheet doesn't really help us there. All right, we can use graphs, which is what I was saying about earlier here. There's a graph at the bottom. There's a graph there. See, this one here, this is less appealing to me because of my problems with my vision. This one here, I, I, I like this one a lot. But then um, uh, down at the bottom in that orange point, there's regression analysis. Uh, what do we remember from one of those early quantitative method learning modules? What do we do? We did a simple we did simple linear regression. Now in level two, you're going to do you're going to do multiple regression. You're going to do time series regression. Level two, you're going to fall in love. I promise you, you're going to fall in love with regression analysis as I take you through all those really really cool models. But essentially, it just uh, is a statistical way of identifying relationships between and among variables. I'm guessing that this is probably sufficient here. Uh, arrow point one and two, if you can memorize those those sentences, that's probably sufficient for the exam. Now, having said that, and noting that there are only two paragraphs and no questions at the end of this learning module, what I suspect the Institute is going to do, this is what I would do if I were making up an exam. I would go ahead and use a simple linear regression model that we learned back in uh, early in the, the, one of those first learning modules. And I would use, let's say, sales and inventory as one of my dependent and an independent variable, and then go ahead and put together a regression analysis, put together some output like we did in that previous learning module, and then ask the question, hey, interpret this thing. And so uh, uh, it, it probably is going to be that simple. Now, what I want you to do is get out your phone and take some pictures. I'm going to go ahead and you know do this. Look, there we got, there we got. How many slides is that? What is that? It looks like a hundred slides. So I want you to go ahead and get your phone out and be ready to take some pictures here. And I'll I'll take you through these activity ratios in general. So go ahead and take a picture of this. Um, Notice the LOS, you're going to have to calculate, so make sure that you know how to calculate each and every one of these ratios. I mean, clearly, the Institute is not going to give you, you know, let's say 30 straight questions and say, hey, calculate debt to asset. Hey, calculate debt to equity. But, of course, they're going to pick and choose, so you need to make certain that you can compute every one of these things. All right, so what was I saying earlier about that activity ratio? Yeah, this is the effectiveness of the executive leadership team in really finding positive net present value projects. Notice that these ratios have the word turnover, or most of them have the word turnover in them. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to turn over the denominator into the numerator. Let's just skip down to the third one here. This is an obvious one. So total asset turnover, and by the way, uh, I ask my students every semester to compute and interpret the total asset turnover. You know, so think about it. We're going to use uh, we're going to use total assets in the denominator, and make sure you compute the average. You know, you take the beginning and take the end and divide by two. Make sure you do the average on many of these ratios, and we're going to divide that by. Uh, I'm sorry, we're going to put that in the denominator and put total revenue in the numerator. Now, the reason that we do the dividing, we take the averages because revenue, re revenue occurs, you know, January, February, all the way through the end of the year. But the assets there at the, the end of last year and the end of this year. So you need to take the average to be reflective of the assets in place that are generating those revenues. And so, you know, what's the goal of the business? Maximize shareholder wealth. So how do we do this? Well, here, on the balance sheet, which is in the denominator, and the income statement, which is in the numerator, we're saying we want to invest, let's say, $100 in a positive net present value project. What we want that project to do then is generate $100 
How about if I use a crazy number? A billion dollars in revenues, right? We want to make a, an investment of 100, generate tons and tons of revenues. Total asset turnover. We want to turn our assets over into revenue. And that interpretation is pretty accurate to describe e each, one of these, uh, each one of these activity ratios. Uh, here's another page of activity ratios. I always ask my students to do uh, fixed asset turnover as well because um, that reflects accumulated depreciation. Um, I hardly ever ask, but that's not really a good indication. I hardly ever do receivables turnover. I tend to give students this receivables turnover so that they can um, compute the day's sales outstanding. That's probably more important than the turnover ratio because, you know, what do you want to do? You want to make a sale and generate $100 in revenue, it would be great if you if you could get cash every time, but that's just not the way it works, uh, especially these days. So what do you do? You extend credit, and what do you want to do? You want all these people to pay you tomorrow or in five days or something or in some short amount of time, but if they pay you in 500 days, well, then that's probably not, that's probably not a positive net present value project. So the day's sale outstanding, I think, is more important than the receivables turnover, even though you need one to compute the other. Liquidity ratios, these are probably the easiest among all the ratios to calculate um, because they are focused on the top left and the top right of the balance sheet. So look at that first one, current ratio. What do we say? How easy is it uh, for the firm to turn its current liabilities into cash? So I'm sorry, turn its current assets into cash so that it can pay its current liabilities. Yeah, so students always say, "All right, Jim, you know, we look up, we look up Procter and Gamble, and they have a current ratio of let's say 0.9. We'll look up Microsoft, and they have a current ratio of 1.2. Somebody else might have 1.4." And the students say, "Well, what's a good one and what's a bad one?" And I say, "Well, I want you to think about it this way: there are risks of the ratio being too high or too low. I mean, the the risk of the ratio being too low is that uh, the firm is unable to meet its short-term obligations." Uh, but you take a look at a company like Procter & Gamble and Johnson & Johnson, they have current ratios that are less than one, which is kind of like a technical definition of insolvency. But I mean, these firms are massive and they can generate cash whenever they want to by just, you know, selling a bunch of uh, Johnson's baby shampoo. And they can use the uh, commercial paper market as well. So some firms are OK having current ratios less than one, but other, other firms are not. But so the risk of having one that's too low is uh, insolvency. The risk of having one too high is what we call underinvestment. You know, we're not finding positive net present value projects. I mean, what's the return on accounts receivable? What's the return on inventory? I mean, I could make the case that those have those have negative uh, rates of return. So uh, remember, insolvency and underinvestment. Now, what that means, and I tell my students, I say, look, you can't just decide if 1.1 is a current is an acceptable current ratio. You need to go and look at the five of your competing competing firms and find out what they're doing over there and use that kind of as a benchmark. All right, you take a picture of this one here. Did you take a picture of that one there? Now this uh, this defensive ratio is a little bit interesting because what it does is it says something like you know, how easy is it us to meet our short term obligations without having to look over on the cash flow statement and see how much cash is coming over? Yeah. That's why it's called defensive. You don't need any cash infusion from uh, from operating cash flow. So what did I just say here? These are short term obligations. So now we're doing long term lob obligations. A lot of times these are called uh, debt ratios or leverage ratios. So this is capital structure ratio. Going back to our conversations uh, about Medigliani and Miller, they're going to teach us lots and lots of really cool things about capital structure. But think of it this way. You've got $100 in assets. The question is, how did you pay for it? Well, some firms might have, might have $30 in liabilities and $70 in equity. Some firms might have $50 
$80 in liabilities and $20 in equity. I'm just using the fundamental accounting equa equation. So these solvency ratios essentially tell us about what is going on on the right-hand side of the balance sheet in terms of financing the left-hand side of the balance sheet. And so what that means then is that, well, if we have lots and lots of debt, that means we have an obligation to make an interest payment. Well, then we have to worry about cash flow, right? We need to look on the cash flow statement and say, all right, I owe the bank $10. I owe the bondholders $20. I owe these people over here $50. Are we generating enough cash flow for me to go ahead and meet those obligations? And those obligations, um, they come due, but then they're due next month and next year and next uh, and next decade. So these are, those are long term. So did you take a picture of that one? Good. Uh, let's look at that interest coverage ratio down here. This is what I was talking about. Just take that operating income, say that's 100, over the interest expense or the interest payments. Suppose that's, uh, suppose that's 25. So what does that tell us? That tell us that we generate enough operating income four times uh, over top of our interest payments. So what do we want? I mean, a low one there, you know, if we if we generate $100 and we have $100 in interest expense, well, that means that we don't have any money left over to reinvest in the company, to pay our shareholders a dividend or, or whatever else we want to do with that money. All right. How about profitability ratios? Let's go ahead and divide these into a couple of categories. Return on sales. So notice there's some kind of a measure of profitability in the numerator. So look down there, gross profit, operating profit, net profit, EBIT, EBT. I mean, you can throw anything in there. Uh, whoops, I didn't mean to go ahead. You can throw almost any kind of a profitability measure in the numerator. And then what are we dividing them by? We're dividing them by revenue. So what do we want to do? We want to make something for pennies, right? And sell it for dollars. So these return on sales will tell us right? Tell us at what stage, at what level we are on the income statement, how well we're doing. So what do we want to do? We want to, I mean, ultimately, we'd like to generate 100 in revenue and then have operating expenses of $1 and then tax expense of five cents and then depreciation, whatever that is. And so we'd want to have, you know, say $94 out of the $100. But of course, that's not possible because you have to incur all these expenses to generate those revenues. So this is pretty much what these return on sales ratios are telling us. And then we have what I always refer to as the profitability, the true profitability ratios, comparing some measure of income. Now, mostly it's going to be net income at the bottom of the income statement over on some account that's on the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. So look at these. We have operating return on assets, and then we have return on assets, then we have return on capital, then we have return on equity. You know, so what we're saying is, all right, what's the bottom of the income statement look like in relation to all of the investments that we made over on the balance sheet, whether it's on the asset left-hand side or the bottom right-hand side of equity? Uh, and there's one more. Do you get a picture of that one there and a picture of that one there? Now, the Institute is very big at the end of this learning module and inside of the learning module of asking you to compute all of these ratios that we just described. And sometimes the Institute goes and gives you a question in which uh, it asks you for um, asked you to solve for a problem using some of these ratios. And here, here's one of those examples. All right, you ready for this? We've got uh, galactic hyper, days outstanding, uh, 22 days, average receivables, 234, cost of goods sold, uh, 1.2 million. So notice what we're being asked here. We're being asked to use these ratios to go ahead and come up back into, so to speak, back into that annual sales. So what we're going to do is we're just going to rearrange that formula that we had on one of those previous slides. And there you go. Do the math pretty quickly. You get, uh, what's that, almost 4 million in sales based on based on a ratio, right? Day sales outstanding and based on receivables and cost of goods sold. Now, here's a good summary uh, slide of what I was just describing in, in, in each of those 
categories of ratios. Some use balance sheet, some use income statement, some use a combination of the two. And then we can go over to the cash flow statement to get something, some extra information, maybe more subtleness, maybe, uh, maybe different kinds of layers in there. Um, yeah, look at that fourth, that third box. This is what I was saying earlier. It's not necessary to use average when the balance sheet items, are, when only balance sheet items are used because they're, they're, they're on the same date. Important to examine a variety of ratios. Of course, it's important to examine a variety of ratios. All right. So think about this kind of a summary question. Here we have a company with uh, uh, dates December 31st. So that second column is 2021, and then that third column is 2020. So we're going to go through these slides, the next slides here, examining these things. We're going to divide them into the different kinds of categories. You know, so what can we say? We say that return on equity and return on assets, both of these have improved over the last year. So this has to be good news, right? It has to be super good news. Current ratio, that's gone from 1.5 to 2.1. Boy, we need to start worrying about what did I call that underinvestment earlier? But clearly, we make the com the conclusion that uh, with that change in current ratio, that we're super able to meet our short-term obligations. Inventory turnover, thirty-one to thirty-five. Uh, maybe we need to worry about that. Net profit margin that goes up. Debt to assets that has gone down. All right. So you ready? So what we go from uh, we go from. 4.12 to 5.71. What is that? Can I do that quickly in my head? 575 divided by 412. Uh, what's that? 35%, 42%, something in there. So that's a huge increase in return on equity. Now the return on assets, because of the fundamental accounting equation, that's not going to increase by that same amount unless there's no debt in the firm. Um, and so that goes up by, boy, what is that? That's only like five or that's less than 10%, say five or 6%, right? So this is all good news. Net profit margin, boy, that... Uh, that double, yeah, that's almost doubled down there. So what are we saying here? From a profitability standpoint, right? Those first two, what do we call those? Return on assets or return on investments. And then that net profit margin, return on sales. So this is all good news, right? Current ratio, uh, what are we saying? That thing goes up and uh, that's probably a good thing. Inventory turnover, yeah, evidence, uh, yeah increase in asset utilization. So, you know, is this something to worry about? I'm not quite sure yet because we need to investigate further. We don't have enough information here, but this is probably good news. We need to be careful about that good news. So we probably need to look at some other inventory turnover ratios, but what we conclude, conclude here that we're uh, increasing our asset utilization. And then debt to asset goes from 53 to 65%. So what did we probably do? We probably issued a bond or took out a bank loan. Uh, we're going to learn in a future learning module on capital structure, uh, this idea of an optimal amount of debt. And so maybe we, uh, maybe we have increased our debt, to, uh, our debt to asset ratio because we are, we are increasing and becoming more optimal. Well, this could be good news or bad news. We're going to learn that there's tax advantages of a bond issue and there are financial distress costs of a bank issue uh, of uh, of a bond issue. All right, let's move on to the DuPont. So what do we know about return on equity? Look there in the very middle of the slide. That's just simply net income divided by average shareholders equity. So what are we doing here? We are going to ask ourselves, and this is what DuPont did decades and decades ago, is can we decompose that and gain some extra value from that decomposition? And the answer is, of course, yes. Now, the trick to all of this DuPont formulation is we're simply going to take that return on equity and we're going to multiply it by one. Now, that's what we do in the green. Look at that second equation. Average total assets over on the far right numerator, average total assets in the far left denominator, right? You put those on top of each other. That's a ratio of one. But what we're going to do is separate them. We're going to divide the net income by average total assets. Well, that gives us return on assets that we did before. And if you put average total assets over average shareholder equity, that is some measure of financial leverage. 
So return on equity here, we've now divided it into two components. Return on assets, which is a measure of profitability, and then financial leverage, which is a measure of capital structure. How are we financing those assets? So I want you to look at that, that formula with the green there. So what do we do? Net income is at the bottom of the right, the bottom of the income statement. How did we get that net income? Well, the only way we got that net income is by investing in positive net present value projects, right? We had to invest in all these assets. Well, what do those assets do? How did we pay for those things? Well, we paid for it with some shareholders equity. We probably have a bond issue in there as well. So that financial leverage ratio tells us about the capital structure. So here we've divided it into just two components. So as you can imagine, we're going to further divide this into two components. So we repeated at the top of the slide what we did at the bottom of the previous slide. But now, now what I want to do is I'm just going to divide net income by revenue. What is that? That's net profit margin. We just did that in a previous slide. And then I'm going to put revenue in the numerator and divide that by average total assets. Well, there's the total asset turnover that we just talked about. And I told you I asked that uh, on all the exams for my students. We're just multiplying by one revenue divided by revenue, but we're separating it into numerators and denominators. So now look what return on equity looks like. It looks like a combination of profitability, efficiency, right? Total asset turnover and leverage. Oh my gosh. So this is such cool stuff. Imagine now we're finding out return on equity here. Let me go back here. Return on equity, which is, you know, think about it. It's just a dull equation, net income over equity. But now, now we can find out about the executive's ability to, well, let's do that first one, make something for pennies and sell it for dollars then make something for pennies and sell it for dollars. How did we invest in those assets to be able to generate that, those revenues? There's the total asset turnover. And then how much debt did we use in that capital structure? So look at the very bottom purple box. This is probably a this is a great exam question. Return on equity. You might think the Institute would just give you net income and average shareholders equity. And if it does, well, that's a super simple uh, solution. But the Institute might give you net profit margin, 10%, might give you total asset turnover, four, might give you leverage, some other number. So you just multiply those and you'll get the return on equity. Now, embedded in all of these ratios, all of these decomposed parts is a measure of the impact of taxes and the interest expense on all of the debt that we have in our capital structure. So what we can do is we can do this again. So all we're going to do is multiply by one, but we're going to do it two times. We're going to multiply by EBT, earnings before taxes, over earnings before taxes, and then multiply by one, EBIT, operating income, over EBIT, operating income. And so note what happens. Look at, let's go right th from the top to the bottom. If you take net income over earnings before tax, that gives you some sense of a tax burden. If you take EBT over EBIT, right, what's the only difference in there? Well, it's the I, so that tells you about the interest burden. And then if you take EBIT over revenue, that's just a regular old profitability margin, right? That you take the very middle of the income statement uh, divided by the top of the income statement. And then you have the total asset turnover and leverage that we uh, described before. So look down at the very bottom. Did you take a picture of this? Here. Here. Did you take a picture of that purple one? Go ahead and take a picture of the purple. Then take a picture of the, uh, the light orange light beige, tan, whatever that color is. So we got the tax burden times the interest burden times margin times asset turnover times leverage. And you see that just from a simple, let me go back here once again, just from a simple net income over uh, shareholders equity, say that's 10%. Well, you have to ask yourself the question, what's the source of that 10%? You know, return on equity. What do we want to do? We want to provide a return to our shareholders so that they can say, you know what, Mr. and Mrs. Executive, you're doing a great job. Here's a bonus. Here's a perk, et cetera, et cetera, if we're the executive leadership team. But now, now what can we do? As a financial analyst, we can evaluate those, uh, those executive leaders and say, okay, 
your return on equity is 10%, this is the source of that 10%. Now here's a summary page. You might want to take a picture of this. Boy, I'm giving you lots and lots of pictures in, uh, in this learning module. This is pretty much a summary of what we've been doing. So let's take a look at an example. All right, you ready? What's a reasonable conclusion an analyst might make based on this ROE decomposition? First thing to note is that the return on equity stays the same from 2017 to 2018, 20%. Notice that interest burden stays the same. Notice that leverage stays the same. Notice that the uh, operating income margin stays the same. So the focus then has to be on the tax burden and the asset turnover. So what happens with asset turnover? It goes from 1.5 to 1.6. So what does that mean? We've got revenues in the numerator, total assets in the denominator. So we've improved our efficiency, so that's good. But the tax burden means that we have less, we have less of an advantage from our tax liabilities, which probably means we, uh, there was probably an increase in the tax, in the tax rate. All right, so what conclusions do we make here in purple? Yeah, um, why? Increase in the average tax rate indicated by the decrease in the value of that tax burden from 75 down to 70, and that probably exactly offsets the improvements in efficiency from the asset turnover ratio. So this is a really good, let me go back here real quick. This is a really good example to, you know, what's that LOS, demonstrate the application of the DuPont. I think from a test creator standpoint, I think it's less interesting to have you go back, and let me go back here quickly, have you go and compute each one of these ratios than it is to provide you with these ratios and then ask you to interpret. And so I think that demonstrate implies that you can calculate and then you can go ahead and interpret. Now, don't get me wrong, I want you to make certain that the calculation, the better question is the one at the bottom here, just the institute giving you those five kinds of ratios and then you compute the ROE and then interpret them in a trend analysis like it we give you in this example here. Now, the last part of this learning module um, is just briefly presented and there are essentially no exam questions at the end of this learning module. So I'm going to go over these rel relatively quickly. Uh, I'm going to try to hit some key points in which the Institute might ask you some questions. Of course, these ratios can be used to evaluate um, performance in specific industries. And we're going to do that in the next couple of slides. So there are these uh, KPIs in each industry that are unique to that industry that you probably ought to know, out, know about. All right, so how about the financial sector ratio? So what do we need to worry about? Capital adequacy. Um, notice the LOS asks us to describe. So even though we show you a calculation there, we probably are not going to be asked to do that on the exam. But the definition of, cap of capital adequacy, and we have that in those first two arrow points there, the measure of bank's ability to absorb losses, and it's a buffer against unforeseen financial downturns, like the 2008 financial crisis, like COVID. So capital adequacy, you know, this is really just a ratio that says something like, you know what, we've got this capital over on the right hand side of the balance sheet. Now remember, a financial institution's balance sheet is heavily, super heavily weighted towards debt. Uh, there's very little equity down on the bot bottom right hand. So that's called the capital. So tier one capital, tier two capital, and then divide by those risk weighted assets. We'll have tremendous conversations in the future about risk weighted assets. But uh, right now you just think about those as an asset value that is weighted by its contribution to risk. Now, minimum reserve requirement, this is set by, at least here in the United States, set by, set by uh, the federal government. They say something like, you know, if you're a bank and you, uh, and you accept $100 in deposits today, you have to keep uh, $12 in cash in case somebody comes in and they want to have, uh, they have cash or they use their debit card or whatever that thing is. And so look at that second orange point. Ensures liquidity and restricts reckless lending and expansion by banks. 
I won't do any editorialization about what's happened in the last, you know, several decades. Of course, these minimum reserve requirements, they, they, they contribute to liquidity and they tend to restrict reckless liquidity. Who knows what goes on in the financial institutions industry? You guys know that better than I do. Nevertheless, what you can do is you can look at this minimum reserve requirement as a ratio reserve requirement, 10% or 12% or whatever that number is. Uh, net interest margin, um, this is the difference between net income and interest expense. You know, you think about what is uh, what do revenues look like for Target or Walmart? That's completely different than the revenues for uh, for a financial institution. You know, you have interest income, right? What does a bank do? It accepts deposits, so it pays an interest rate on those deposits, and it makes loans, and it receives an interest rate and interest payment on those loans. So that's really this the difference between the interest that flows to the liabilities and interest from the assets and that gives us our net interest uh, net interest margin so what do we want to do we want to we want to pay our depositors one percent and we want to uh, pay our borrower i'm sorry receipt charge our borrowers eight percent or twelve percent or fifty percent whatever that number is there fifty percent i think that only happens in uh, in certain movies you guys ever watch the godfather you guys old enough to watch the godfather movies now, minimum reserve requirements, these are a highly liquid form of the minimum quality of the assets. What does it say there? Smooth, uh, smooth operations. How about a retail business like, uh, you know, like Walmart? So what are we interested in? Uh, I'll go ahead and give you an example. I wish I knew what year this was. I've tried to figure this out, but I haven't spent a whole lot of time figuring it out. I remember there was one quarter in which the sales for McDonald's finally declined. I mean, McDonald's had a history of like, you know, a million quarters that their revenues increased. I mean, a lot of that is due to expansion, but they had one quarter where their, uh, where their sales or their revenues dropped. And so that's all we're doing here, right? We're trying to say something like, let's say, comparable store sales over time period. And we can put that in a ratio like we do at the bottom. And then you can do sales per square foot. Service industry, you can do revenue per employee. You can do net income per employee. The hotel industry, of course, occupancy is super uh, important. Uh, average revenue per user. You know, I'm always fascinated when my wife and I go somewhere, usually do a wedding and, uh, you know, we check into a hotel and sometimes there's tons and tons of people around and sometimes there are not. And I always wonder to myself, I say, man, I always, uh, always question how hotels uh, uh, can generate a sustainable and consistent profit. And some do and some don't. Now, I'm a big fan of these business risk ratios, coefficient of variation. We learned that all the way back in one of those early uh, learning modules. Notice the definitions over on the right, standard deviation over a mean. That's just uh, what a coefficient of variation means. But what we're doing here is we can do this. We can compute the CV of operating income, of net income, of revenues. I mean, we can do almost anything that we want. So I want you to think about this. Uh, there were no practice questions at the end of this learning module, but I'm going to give you the answer to one of these questions if the Institute uh, asks us on the exam. You know, think about, let's do the bottom one, variation of revenues. So um, imagine you have two columns. So you got revenues for Target and you have revenues for Walmart, right? And let's just suppose we go and compute the last, I don't know, three years of quarterly revenues, right? So you have a column like that. And then underneath that column, and I'm assuming this is an Excel spreadsheet, you hit your function wizard and you compute the standard deviation. And then you hit the function wizard and you compute the mean. And then you divide those by, you divide those by each other. Put the standard deviation in the numerator, put the mean in the denominator. So what does that tell us? Maybe, let's suppose that uh, Walmart is 10 and uh, Target is 8. I'm making those numbers up, obviously. So what does that tell us? Well, for every unit of the mean, in the denominator, in this case, revenue. For every dollar of revenue, we're willing to accept or we have generated that standard deviation in the numerator. So what did I say, eight and 10? 
I forget which was which. So if the uh, if if Walmart was ten, what we're saying then that the dispersion of revenue for Walmart is greater. Ah, so this is a great way, business risk ratio, this is a great way to evaluate the variability in operating income or net income or average revenue. So I'm using that term variability as a measure of risk. And this is, this is business risk here. There you go. There's an easy question on the exam for you to answer. Now, at the very end of this learning module, there's a section on predicting or estimating financial performance. What do we want to do? We want to estimate revenues. We want to estimate operating income. We want to estimate net income. We want to estimate cash flow. We want to estimate operating cash flow. We want to estimate uh, free cash flow. So how do we do this? Well, we take the financial statements and we take the ratios. We compare those ratios against the trend. We compare those ratios against our peer firms and then we perform these analyses down here at the bottom. So these are really important. Sensitivity analysis. So what I want you to do is I want you to think of an Excel spreadsheet. And that Excel spreadsheet has a whole bunch of input variables. And all you do is you have an output variable. Maybe it's revenue, maybe it's earnings per share, maybe it's free cash flow, whatever it is. And what you do is you go ahead and change one of those variables and you recompute. Change another one and recompute. There, notice we have the what if in quotation. So what if something happens? In other words, we're trying to compute free cash flow to the firm. We start with revenues of 100 and that's our most likely outcome. So let's go back and say, you know, what if people really like our product? Maybe it'll be 110. Let's go ahead and recompute that. Uh, let's go ahead and recompute. So that's called sensitivity analysis. Now, scenario analysis is on a much more global level. What we're going to say there is suppose we have different scenarios, and these typically are based on economic events like, and this is, this is standard question creation, is that you might say, hey, there are three scenarios. There's the normal economy, the regular old economy, if the economy grows by, let's say, 3%. And then we have... Uh, we have over here a less likely scenario. Maybe this scenario is suppose we have a recession where the, uh, the economy f uh, declines by 2%. And then over here, we have a super economic expansion where the economy grows by 7%. So what did I say? You have a minus two, you have a three, and you have a seven, right? So you look at all of those different scenarios. And in this case, it's three. I can't imagine the Institute giving you 27 different economic scenarios. So probably two, maybe three. And so you can look at these uh, key financial quantities. You can look at those KPIs that we talked about just uh, just a second ago, different scenarios. And then what you can do is a Monte Carlo simulation or any kind of other simulation in which you do the sensitivity analysis or the scenario analysis by writing an algorithm, right? You know, I mean, there are tons of programs out there. Monte Carlo is one in which you say something like, you know what, here is the district. Let's go back to my example with the free cash flow to the firm. Here is revenue, $100, but here is the distribution of revenues. All right, so I'm gonna draw this normal distribution, right? And so what a Monte Carlo simulation will do is it will substitute, it will pull something from that normal distribution and throw it into the revenues and then recompute free cash flow to the firm. And you can, you can do this so that each one of those input variables has its own distributions. It doesn't have to be normal, but it could be normal. Mm -hmm. And so at the end, instead of getting, you know, under sensitivity analysis, we might get 10 different free cash flow uh, to the firm estimates. Under scenario analysis, we're going to get three, if there were those three that I said earlier, we're going to get three free cash flow to the firm uh, outputs. But under Monte Carlo simulation and other simulation, we could get tens of thousands, maybe even a hundred thousand of these things. And then, then we can start bringing in probability models, uh, and all sorts of fun stuff. So I would remember the difference between and among sensitivity scenario and simulation. If you can remember my examples there, you'll, you'll have no problem answering questions on the exam. Mm -hmm. So here's the last slide that just pretty much uh, summarizes what we've been talking about here. So what do we do on that right side? We take balance sheet and income statement and cash flow stuff, and we forecast capital structure, and we forecast free cash flow to the firm. We forecast 
depreciation expense. We forecast interest expense. We forecast tax expense. Boy, that's always a good one, right? Here in the United States, we have no idea what the tax rate is going to be tomorrow, let alone uh, let alone uh, next tax year. So that takes us through our LOSs. I want you to go to that uh, end of the learning module. There are a bunch of really, really good questions in there. Um, you're going to need some time. I'm going to say 40 minutes uh, of your time to work through those. But you'll note that the second LOS, activity, liquidity, solvency, and profitability, and the DuPont stuff, those are the focus that the Institute uh, places in this uh, series of questions. So that should be your focus as well. Hey, thanks for watching. I hope you guys have a great day and good luck studying.